Good evening. The talk will be about init LE and performance improvements, and it will be a more generic talk, and these improvements could be implemented in all the different init ID implementations. Maybe not MKOSI uh, init ID, but most others probably. First, I will introduce myself. Then I will give a quick um, introduction of what is in init LE so that you can all follow the talk. Then I will talk about what to optimize for, and then I will present the different optimizations. First, the optimization for the compression, then improving the speed for listing and extracting the init IDs, and then what could be done in the future if I have enough time in the talk and also in the future. First, a few words about me. I'm Benjamin Drong. I discovered free and open source software during my university and I got hooked, so I decided to leave the ugly Windows world and go to the new shiny uh, free and open source software world and became quickly Ubuntu developer and also Debian developer. Since two and a half years, I've been working for Canonical and the Ubuntu Foundations team, making sure that the foundation of the Ubuntu operating system is stable and up to date or breaks, depending on how good you are. And uh, if you want to talk to me afterwards, uh, look for the guy in the red shirt. So, and if you miss me today, you can maybe, if I, we meet next time, just look for the dude in the red shirt again. So let's start. What is an init ID? Who knows what an init ID is? Please raise your hand. So most people raised your hand. So let's only do a quick look at that. An init ID is a, CPO archive, or it could be multiple CPO archives concatenated to, together. And CPO archives are similar to tarballs. They can, can just contain some files. And these uh, CPO archives could be compressed depending on, you could use different compression algorithms depending on what the kernel supports. And they are used during boot process. Looking at the boot process, if you power on your machine, then the boot firmware loads, normally UFI, then the boot loader like systemd boot, grub, or whatever, and then you load the kernel init ID and command line, or what people do here in the conference, they use UKIIs, which contain all these three, and the kernel loads the init ID, extracts it, and then runs the slash init inside, and the init ID tries to figure out what's the root device, tries to mount that, and hand over the control to the PID1 of the, your root file system. Um, then, about building in IDs, you normally the tools copy the files that they want to have in the init RD into a temporary directory, and that's the part where all the, most of the time is spent, because it's not easy, as we heard in the previous talk as well. And when everything is there, then you create an CPI archive out of it, and maybe you compress it at the end. So let's dive into the details. If you want to optimize, you can try to optimize in different directions. For example, you can try to improve the boot speed, that the system boots faster, because then you have to wait less time. Or you can try to optimize the on-disk size of the init ID. That will help people that decided to have a smaller ESP partition 10 years ago and now they run out of space. Or you can try to optimize the creation speed so that you don't have to wait so long if you update a new kernel. Or you can try to optimize the memory consumption either during boot and also during creation time. But there's a problem. You can't. Often, if you try to optimize, you can't optimize all the four targets. Sometimes they are conflicting, especially if you want to reduce the size of the init ID. You can take a better compression algorithm or higher compression levels, but they take longer, longer time and also often need more memory. So if you ha use set default settings for your init ID, it depends on your hardware that you run on it, if it's a good choice or a bad choice. Um, for example, if you 
use Z standard with the highest compression level, minus 19. That can t take very long. We had a bug report that uh, took over an hour on uh, NISA boards, which is a small RISC-V development machine. So that's not a, a time that you want to wait if you just update the kernel. But the even bigger problem is um, if you have a high compression level, if your device doesn't have enough memory, you can run out of memory, and then you are screwed. Hello, Raspberry Pis. Um, so we had multiple um, discussions in Ubuntu several years ago, and we settled on using C standard minus one as default, so that we don't run out, out of memory on um, low memory devices, and also don't take too long on these not powerful machines but still get a relative decent uh, compression ratio. So let's talk about what we did in Ubuntu to optimize the compression. The idea is uh, compressing the init ID on the user's machine um, can, cannot use the high compression levels, so why not do it outside of the user's machine? Um, we had multiple iterations for that, and the final um, approach was as followed. First, let's explain what the overall compression life cycle is for a kernel model. If we build a new kernel on the build machine, we build the kernel and all the models, then we put all the models in a Debian package. That Debian package is then compressed with the standard, shipped to the customer, the user downloads the kernel model, and when you install the kernel model package, then the package is extracted, and all the kernel models are placed on the file system decompressed. If the user then creates an init ID, this init ID um, copies the kernel modules, puts them in a CPR archive, and then compresses the CPR archive again, and when the system boots, the kernel decompresses the CP, uh, archive and um, runs the, the, the boot process. So we have compression, decompression, compression, decompression. And the solution is, let's rip out one step of decompression and compression. So nowadays, since Ubuntu 23.10, we compress the kernel models during package build. There we can use the highest compression level and ship these compressed kernel models in a Debian package where we, that we don't compress anymore because compressing compressed files is a step too much. If a user installs the kernel models, these will be stay compressed on the file system. And if we put them in an init ID, we put these files in a separate CPI archive that we don't compress anymore. So the init ID consists of two files now, or two concurrent CPI archives. The first one contains all the compressed files, and the second part con contains the rest, and only we compress the rest of the, uh, the files that we need. And then the benefit is if we boot the system, the kernel um, doesn't have to decompress the kernel models because it just reads the, CPR, the first uncompressed CPI archives into memory, and only the kernel modules that are actually needed for booting are loaded by the kernel and then uh, decompressed on the fly. The result of that is that we need half the disk space on a regular installation. We need three times less peak memory because the, during boot we don't need to decompress all files, but only um, the kernel models that are actually loaded. The init ID generation is faster. Um, I don't have exact numbers for that because we did other improvements, uh, like stealing some code from Draycut uh, to make it faster. So with all the other combinations, uh, it was two and a half times faster on a regular installation. And we got faster boot speeds on systems that had processes that were slow, um, where the compression difference would, was um, noticeable. If you have a fast desktop machine, it doesn't matter if you have these standard compressed files or not, uh, it's too fast to, to notice. 
But on small, uh, uh, slow ones like the version 5.2 board, I noticed 10 seconds um, boot speed improvement with 20% of the, nearly 20% of the boot time it had. Uh, the only downside is that the kernel package is a little bit bigger because um, if you compress all the uncompressed kernel models together, uh, you can um, benefit of um, saving space by um, by uh, utilizing the, 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 the similarity, similarity between the kernel models. But if you just compress uh, each individual kernel model separately, uh, you don't benefit from the cross models um, similarities. The next thing to optimize um, was that I noticed after the change, we had now not an init ID where we had more or less one big CPU archive that was compressed, but a big CPU archive followed by a compressed one. And the somehow the tools for listing the content of the init RD and also for extracting the init RD was much slower than before. Um, the tools that we use in Debian and Ubuntu are called LS initRAMFS for listing and unmk initRAMFS for extracting. And um, these are shell scripts that do some logic to figure out where the boundaries are between these CPU archives. And this shell logic is quite um, slow, so that could be optimized. Back at the time, um, I w had a long wish to learn Rust. So I th thought that would be a good idea to actually learn Rust and do something useful that is not done by anyone else yet, else, and uh, something that could be used later on as well. So I thought, how hard could it be to implement? Surprise, it wasn't hard. So here comes it. Um, thanks to a colleague, it's called 3CPIO. It's a tool for handling CPIO files for init RDs especially. So it can handle um, init RDs with multiple CPIOs. And the goal is to make it the fastest implementation that we have on the planet. To my measurements, it's the fastest. If you find something that is faster on a certain area, then please let me know and let's try to make it the fastest. Um, it's compared to the LS init RMFS, it's uh, what I measured up to 274 times faster. So LS in RMFS took 15 seconds on my desktop machine and afterwards it took maybe 20 milliseconds. Um, that's the bottleneck of the sh slow shell scripting that we had before. And it's also f faster in decompressing. Um, Archboot um, looked at it and picked it up and used it now for their um, live systems, and they noticed it's 25% faster on their machines. So let's look at the future. I have big plans for CP 3 CPIO. Um, I like to add creation support that's currently work in progress. So with that, it could be replace all the cases where you can very currently use CPIO. And the, the further improvement would be to change the init ID generation tools to not create intermediate temporary directories. So that when you create the init ID, you just um, collect the information which files do you want to have in the init ID, and then call 3CPIO saying, OK, I want to have that file in that place in the init ID and that file there and so on, so that you don't have to copy the file multiple times because you can just create a CPIO just from the files that you have on your file system without just having a temporary directory where you make sure that the files have the correct name and path. That's all, questions?
Questions? Many, yes. So I didn't understand why uh, the CPIO tooling matters at uh, during during boot. Why, why is it faster? Um, for Arch boot, they are um, extracting uh, the an init ID, and um, there they they use CPIO. Now they own three CPIO, and that makes uh, improvement. But isn't it extracted by the kernel? Um, so not, I haven't looked too much into detail, but the um, Archboot has two levels of booting. Ah, okay, okay. So the initial init RD that is booted by the kernel is done by the kernel, but then the code inside the init RD extracts itself or some second level um, using 3CPIO. Can you specify what Archboot is for those who don't know? Um, it's, uh, as far as I've read, a live system for Arch. This is a random one, but uh, out of curiosity, uh, why did I know why? But I guess it was surprising to me that you you listed not compressed package. Like I get why you change the package to not compress. Like I don't know if RPM even supports that, right? Like it's just interesting because like does it matter to not compress the package? Like if you'd continue to do that, who would have noticed or cared? You know what I mean? Okay. Uh, you, yeah, we could continue compressing the kernel modules package. Um, I'm not sure if we have measured the difference. Pro I would assume that we, if we do that, the difference would be marginal. And so we just say, don't comp compress it because it does, doesn't give us, us any benefits. And it's very um, slow to build because there are many files. So it takes a lot of time to compress. And it's so much faster when you don't compress. And if you don't get anything, yeah. How were you able to achieve such a speed boost over CPIO? Are you parallelizing the work? How 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 are you? So, so the yeah. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so the the, the big uh, performance benefits. Um, let's go back. Um, most of that is just the, the reference uh, shell logic is so slow that this, you can okay. easily beat it. But if you compare three CPIO against CPIO itself, it's a few times faster. Um, I haven't looked into why it's so fa much faster. I uh, also compared it three CPIO against BSD, what's called BSD, um, there's, there's a BSD variant that you can um, handle CPIO archives as well, and that is sim has a similar speed as 3CPIO. So maybe the kernel calls that we are then. using uh, is different. Uh, you mentioned the lower peak memory usage during the unpacking by the kernel, by doing this uh, kernel modules in an uncompressed one. How do you even measure the memory usage at that early stage in the boot? Um, I didn't measure the usage during in the, in the init RD boot phase. Uh, we just measure if you extract the init RD, how much memory or how much size does it take? Because so the kernel needs to extract the whole init RD, and that needs to reside on the memory. OK, so you measured it just in like a regular user space uh, decompression, and then from there inferred that the kernel would need the same? Or yeah. So for example, if you, um, the init RD, if you extract that, um, then a 100 megabyte init RD explodes to 700 megabytes. And if you keep the kernel models compressed, the init RD might be still 100 megabytes or 95 megabytes, but if you extract it, then the <coughs> kernel motor stay compressed, and then it's only 250 or 300 megabytes. Okay. Depending on how much you stuff into the init RD. So if you have, um, especially NVIDIA and AMD uh, kernel models and firmware files, um, then the init RD, key, and init RD can become quite big. How do, you do, how do you do the split between the compressed and uncompressed file? Is it like manually specified in record or something, or do you, is it probably probably or like? Uh, so um, the 
uh, CPL archives have an end marker, a, tr uh, a file called trailer, where it indicates that the CPL archive ends. And then um, you look if something is left after that. And if that has a, the beginning of that is a normal CPR archive, then you say, okay, it's a normal one. But if not, you will detect, okay, it's a compressed something and you decompress the remaining bits. Sorry, when, I mean, when you build it, not when you decompress it, when you build it, how do you decide? Do you manually specify, I want to have those kernel modules, those files, which are kernel modules, and want to have them in the second part of the initRMFS, or do you just uh, let Draco do a thing or something? Right, so um, when we build it, so we um, create a temporary directory where we put all the files that we want, and then we run a find command over the directory, searching for all the files with Z standard or XZ extension, put all the files that we find there in an uh, uncompressed text file, and then another find for finding all the other files that are not with that extension, put that in the compressed text file, and then say, okay, the uncompressed text file is the input for the first CPIO, and the compressed file, uh, text file is the input for the second CPIO call. Any other questions or comments? Last chance, no more talks after this. We have a couple of minutes. So you have time to <laughs> grab some beer? <laughs> or I can just do some buzzwording. Um, so maybe I just should say that this talk isn't about TPM. So <laughs> that, no! <laughs> that we have that. Uh, it's my bad for accepting it. Sorry. <laughs> All right, well then, thank you very much.